tonight, we want to focus on the defense attorneys, Dick Harpoolian and Jim Griffin. One thing to know about Dick Harpoolian, he's widely considered to be one of the best attorneys in the state. He served as a deputy solicitor in the late 70s and was later elected solicitor in the 80s. Well, in his time at the Fifth Circuit, Harpoolian prosecuted hundreds of murder cases, including 12 death penalty cases. Among those cases was for South Carolina's most notorious serial killer, Donald Pee Wee Gaskins, who was later sentenced to death. Now, for the last 20 years, Harpoolian has been in private practice. As for Jim Griffin, he may be more connected to the Murdoch family than anyone on the defense team. Not only is he representing Alec for this trial, but he also represented Paul Murdoch after the boat crash that killed Mallory Beach. Well, Griffin is in a trial and a health care lawyer with more than 30 years of experience. And while a lot of his focus has been on representing health care providers, he also has experience in civil and criminal courts at the state and federal levels. Now we talked with a former law partner of Hartpoolian who also has done extensive work with Griffin. And we asked him how Hartpoolian and Griffin will work together. And he says that they have their own strengths and we will see a certain dynamic between the two. You know Dick Hartpoolian probably better than anybody in the state. If we go back a long way. How do you think he's preparing right now? That same way? Yeah, he, uh, we practiced here together uh, in this building for eight years after we tried the Gaskins case. Uh, and Dick is, Dick is very bright. Mm -hmm. And so he can look at things uh, and grasp something, whereas it takes me, he can, he can grasp it within an hour, where it might take me three hours to organize it in my head. Dick has that ability to really put it together quickly and retain it. Uh, so uh, I've always been impressed with that, and he's always yelled at me about you preparing, and you know you you can't sit there at that desk all day. And I said, you know, yes, I can. Whereas he can go ahead and absorb things a lot quicker, or does absorb things quicker uh, than most people I know. So what do you think is his focus going into this trial? Well, I think I think Dick is going to probably handle the confrontational witnesses, the people who are going to be have given statements, uh, who are subject to cross examine everybody's subject to cross examine but people who actually really are putting some evidence into the uh, into the case, police officers, uh, some of the lay witnesses that are going to be down there. I mean, Dick is going to take take that part of it, and he will be very confrontational. He's very good, very effective in the courtroom. Uh, and uh, Jim Griffin, I suspect, Jim is you know, very bright, uh, and I've tried cases with him and Dick, uh, and so we always look to Jim for the uh, academic, uh, you know, uh, input into complicated issues. But he's far more than that. He also is a good trial lawyer. Uh, but we tried a complicated case up in Charlotte a couple of years ago, and if Jim wasn't there, talking about the legal issues involved, uh, Dick and I would not really been able to follow it. So Jim, Jim has a, he adds something to that team, a tremendous amount. But I don't know that you'll see him arguing with witnesses and confronting some of the lay witnesses that are going to be there. I think that Dick is probably going to do that. So you think with this trial, there may be a bit of some sort of role play where Dick will be the one that will be confrontational with the witnesses, be up front, and then Mr. Griffin would be the one who would be there kind of in, in more background, adding in some academic. Yeah, I would expect that, uh, knowing, the, knowing both of them. Uh, they're, they're both good lawyers, but they're both good lawyers in their respective areas. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, to me, Jim is somebody I would go to. Dick and I go to, we, we go to each other all the time about uh, running a strategy or uh, talking about a legal issue. I mean, it's not unusual for us to get on the phone with each other and, and talk about things like that. And for much more on day four of the Alec Murdoch murder trial, we now want to bring in our trial analysts, Grant Varner, Kim Varner, both defense attorneys here in Greenville. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us once again. And Grant, we were talking earlier. We heard the 911 calls. We heard the body cam from that deputy. But you were saying today was a big day for the defense. Why is that? Well, it, let's kind of back up a second. The prosecution spent most of the day mm -hmm. talking about what a great job they feel they did securing the scene, water around the body, and how they feel it may or may not have gotten there. And uh, a lot of reference to the dead chicken. I'm not sure what the point of that was today. Maybe they'll reveal later. But they also spent a fair bit of time talking about their interactions and perceptions of mm -hmm. Alec Murdoch on the scene. And then the defense came in and through the state's own witnesses, 
got a lot of questions answered that the state left wide open. Such as? Uh, well, it, I'm going to let Kim discuss that because we've been talking about it all afternoon and, okay. and I like a lot of what he has to say on it. Okay. There was approximately 10 minutes of testimony from the, I believe, the captain of the police department about these tire imprints near the, I believe it was the, the, the hangar. Okay. And he created a mystery. I think everybody on the jury was wondering, what is this mystery vehicle? Is that one of Alex's other vehicles? And they made a thing about how did they get down there because it's so far away. But after all that time, um, Dick Harpulian came up and said, did you determine where those tire tracks came from? And the captain said, yes. And he said, they came from the caretaker for the dogs. He said, yes. That's going to be significant later on because in closing arguments, what Dick has the option of arguing is they've created evidence mm -hmm. of some nefarious activity when there was just normal activity, nothing happened. If they have a legit case, they're going to stick to the facts and point to what's important. They're sending out red herrings to keep you diverted and to get you confused. Okay. And they're afraid of you. They're not telling you the whole story. Why didn't they go ahead and tell you these things? And he's going to try to create the appearance that the prosecution doesn't trust the jury with full information, which can be very useful in a closing argument. Okay. So in a way, you're saying that Dick Harpoolian may be setting up for something bigger. Well, I think absolutely. Okay. Yeah. He, he is deliberately downplaying it rather than being attacking at this point in time. Once you get to the closing arguments, there's no chance for rebuttal. It's over. Okay. That's when you're going to see the real punch come. Okay. And so as far as the prosecution, we, we it almost kind of seems like this is like step one. They're kind of setting the scene as far as the number one calls in the body so. cam footage. It, it's, it's very early. And I, I thought that another big day for the defense or another big thing for the defense today was, you know, more unanswered questions. Why didn't they search the home? Murdoch gave them permission to search the home. They were there to secure the scene. And they, they indicated through testimony the scene would include the house because Alec Murdoch indicated very clearly, I went to the house and retrieved a shotgun. Mm -hmm. They made a big presentation of, is this the shotgun? Is this, who unloaded it? Who stored it? Who right. secured it? He's obviously been in the house. He's given permission to search the house. You know, from a defense attorney perspective, I want to know why didn't you go ahead and search the house? You had the opportunity. Why wasn't it done? That's going to raise a lot of questions. Oh, uh, another question that was left unanswered today. You know, they they said there was a conflict with the sheriff's office, and they were just going to secure the scene and then allow sled to process it. Yet it appeared to me through testimony, the sheriff's department is indicating well, we went ahead and started processing the scene, which may have led to monstrous contamination of the scene. Right. And you mentioned the contamination of the scene. We were mentioning earlier as well that Dick Hartpoolian really focusing on his cross-examination. He focused in on the possibility of contamination. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like he should have gone a little bit more in depth about maybe the 911 no, calls? No, not okay. at this stage. I think it's kind of like boxers. He's doing body punches. Okay. So that they drop their guard and he'll try to do the knockout punch. One of the things that came out and the captain, I thought, came across as either incredibly fair mm -hmm. and credible, oh, yeah. or he didn't want to get, you know, he could be favorable to Murdoch. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or he didn't want to get cross-examined. He knew where it was coming. But there were all these things about the tire tracks. And there's a big question. How many vehicles were there? Who came in? Were there two shooters? Was there one? And the captain testified that he was notified very early there were two sets of tire tracks. They never took any castings, they didn't take any pictures, and they knew from the testimony that rain was coming in the next 45 minutes. They were going to be gone. Mm. He's going to really hit them hard with the fact they didn't do a proper investigation. Uh, the thing about going to the house uh, was very clear. It's the same line. Sure. But what I saw that was very important for the defense today was the jury is only you know, a few feet from Alex. He was visibly shaking. Tears were running down his face. How's that going to impact the jury? I mean, he could be a psychopath. He could be a great actor. Or he could be innocent. You don't know what that jury's thinking. But they watch that. And that certainly is going to have an impression on people sitting on the jury. Okay. A lot of emotion there inside the courtroom and over all that audio that we had to hear. Okay. Farners, thank you very much for joining us here this evening. You guys will be back for tomorrow, day five. Tori?